Kia ora koutou. Hi, I'm Holly. Um, I'm from the University of Canterbury and today, oh, <laughs> I'm going to be talking about trophic connections in braided rivers. So for anyone who doesn't know, trophic connections are just the feeding links between species that live within the ecosystem. And in this case, the ecosystem is a braided river. Um, before I go any further, I'd just like to say um, a lot of people have helped me collect data so far, and this is just the beginning of my PhD. So my supervisors, Angus, Jono and Tara, and also Richard Maloney, who helped me a lot with the birds. As I said, um, I'm a student at the University of Canterbury, and I also work on the Cass River, like Fraser. As you can see, the Cass River is pretty unconstrained in the lower reaches near um, the lake, Pikapo. And what this means is it has a really diverse range of aquatic habitat. You've got that main braid on the uh, left, of you guys, <laughs> left of the screen there, but a whole bunch of other channel types there as well. And this means that in an unconstrained state, braided rivers are really heterogeneous. They have a lot of different habitat available to them. You've got those main channels that are really typical of what you think of in the regatada, like deep, swift, big river channels. But at the other end of that, you've also got upwelling areas and groundwater springs that are created from old braid pathways. And in between these two channel types, you've pretty much got everything else. You've got shallow channels that are refilling, that are drying up, that are deep, that are shallow, that are swift, that are slow. And um, essentially what this means is there's a lot more habitat available. And this is important because habitat heterogeneity can contribute to resilience of the whole ecosystem. What I mean by resilience is that um, after a disturbance, something like a flood, um, those properties of the ecosystem that we care about bounce back. So you might have a population of birds in a flood that disappear, they can come back afterwards and um, it still looks like a braided river and it still has all those properties that we um, link to braided rivers. Oh. Cool. Um, and the way that habitat heterogeneity does this is um, through a variety of mechanisms. Um, so that lots of different environmental um, variation can um, mean there's more biodiversity because you, you get species that um, with more specific needs that can exist in um, certain parts of the river. This creates more options for food for mobile consumers who can move between the habitats. And it also creates um, refuges in things like floods where some parts of the river aren't impacted as badly during a flood as other parts of the river. All these things contribute to the total ecosystem resilience. Um, but today, I'm not going to be talking about all these things. I'm mainly just going to be focusing on the options for food that this habitat provides. So just a rundown of the rest of the talk. I'm going to be talking about heterogeneity in braided rivers, in particular the CAS where I work, because all the data I collected from there. Um, I'm going to be talking about how this relates to food web structure. Um, so there'll be a couple of like graphs, which hopefully I'll be able to walk you through, <laughs> and how this food web structure links to resilience of food webs and ecosystems. So this is a plot of um, channel types on the CAS. I collected it a couple of weeks ago, so it's June, it's um, cold weather. And essentially this plot is showing you a whole bunch of physical variables compressed into two axes. On the y-axis, you've got a decreasing width, depth and turbidity as you go up. So increasing like deep rivers at the bottom. Uh, and on the x-axis, you've got temperature and dissolved oxygen. And what this is showing you is that minor channels have lots of variation in their um, temperature in June, but they're still reasonably cold. And, but they're quite shallow and clear, whereas the big major channels don't have much variation in temperature, but they can be much um, more turbid. And then on the right here, you've got things like springs, which actually are warmer in winter um, and clearer. Um, so this is spatial heterogeneity. 
You also get temporal heterogeneity within these habitats and you can actually get role switching. So in the summer, um, those minor channels, which are shallower, will be much warmer than your groundwater springs and main braids. Um, so all, all you have to take away from this is there's a lot of variation in physical attributes. Actually um, create um, a lot of options for food availability because um, if you think about those two key things I was talking about, temperature and turbidity, that's the conditions that different things need to grow in, especially plants, right? Um, and then the things that can access this wide range of um, habitats like mobile consumers, birds, you've got a rival up there, um, they have more options within the larger space. Um, so I'm just going to show you another complicated graph, but this is essentially just showing you that um, within these different aquatic habitat types, there's a wide variety of um, different primary producers or things that grow on the rocks. <laughs> um, and so um, different species that can access all these, these um, variable um, habitats have more options. So when you're thinking about back to the main braid that is deep and swift and wide, you probably aren't going to get that much growing there. Um, you might just get very small amounts of algae that can be fed on by mainly just mobile invertebrate that aren't going to be washed away in swift, heavy water, so things like um, mayflies. Um, this is a hypothetical food web of a main braid, so you're not going to have very much um, resources and invertebrate, but um, they are fed on by fish and birds. So a food web that looks like this is all it's essentially telling you is that as things um, have more length in their uh, feeding, so yeah, as, as the mayfly is fed on by the fish as the bird, that um, energy is increasing in trophic position. So the bird at the top has a higher trophic position than the mayfly at the bottom. And the total space that all the species take up in a food web is known as like the niche of the um, of the food of the whole ecosystem food web. So I'm going to show you this uh, sort of a main braid food web um, with data from the CAS. And this is essentially the same thing as the previous slide. Um, where you've got on the x-axis and the on the oh, sorry other way around <laughs> trophic position on the y-axis resource diversity on the x-axis. This is just the invertebrate um, in the main um, channel, and you can see there's not a large amount of diversity in resources and not a large um, variation in trophic. So there's not a large amount of trophic variation even between predators and grazers. Um, but what I've just been talking about, made major braids aren't the only habitats on a braided river. We know that now this is traditionally how aquatic ecologists would have thought of as a braided river, um, but they're not. And so if you add in more habitat, you instantly get more species, right? got twice the amount of um, invertebrates there. But you still don't actually have that much resource diversity in each of these different habitats and not that much variation in um, trophic position as well. So what this means is, in terms of resource diversity, you have a food web that's more linear um, and low resource breadth means there's more um, vulnerability in the populations that feed on these resources um, because the predators are constrained by their options for food, right? So um, you might have more competition um, for food within a population. So all the black-fronted terns are competing as individuals for the fish or the mayflies. And you've got between... Um, population competition as well. So the, the fish and the rivals are competing for the food as well. Um, and you also might get um, switching for to lower um, alternative prey resources as well. This has been shown in fish that when they have less options in the water, they might eat terrestrial 
food sources which are actually lower in quality. They don't have as much energy, resulting in uh, sort of maybe a weaker population as well. So um, food webs like this are often um, sort of associated with higher levels of population fluctuation for all the species in the food web and um, can lead to local population extinctions. Going back to the food webs on the CAS, so we know that these are invertebrate food webs. They're actually connected by mobile consumer species like fish. And what that means is you get a food web that actually looks like this, where you've got much more resource diversity because fish can access more um, habitats and, and different resources. And not only, oh sorry, so this graph, I've just simplified the uh, invertebrate food webs so you could do some more um, clarity on what's going on there. Um, not only are fish connecting these habitats, but you've also got birds um, which are integrating terrestrial resources as well. So um, you've also got here uh, spiders, predatory invertebrate, um, herbivores like grasshoppers. Um, you've got the fish still there and you've got birds that also feed on them and have a um, quite large range in their trophic positions as well. And all this essentially means is there's a, a lot more diversity and options in the food web. And so you get a food web that looks more like this. This food web um, has more asymmetry in its resource pathways. So um, all the resources down the bottom are the same, but they're from different sites and they can follow different pathways to get to the top predators. They can go through different linking patterns. Not only that, um, you can get spatial variation in the strength of interactions. So the same resource in two different places um, might be preferred from one place than the other. Ultimately, food webs that look like this um, are more stable you get less population fluctuations because if you have a river that looks like this, lots of habitat, sometimes of the year, this is the cast, by the way, um, all these um, predators like the fish and the birds can access all the habitats there. But sometimes of the year, like spring, you'll get a bunch of snow melt that wipes out all the main mayflies in the main braid. Luckily, on the cast, there's a lot of habitat heterogeneity all those predators can still move to the clear um, areas that are less impacted by flooding and still have aquatic resources available. Not only is this important um, for flooding, but we have reduced heterogeneity due to things like weed invasion. So you can see here that river in the middle there, it kind of just looks like a main braid, right? So the food web in that channel will be much more linear, it's likely to be much more linear. We're losing that aggregated um, levels of resources and creating stronger interactions between species. And this can lead to um, population fluctuation and local extinctions. It may be one of the contributing factors um, for lots of populations on our lower braided rivers. So thank you listening and if there are any questions that you know. Um, so yeah it could be something different it could be uh, some parts of those minor braids are upwelling groundwater so um, for example the the fully groundwater springs have much more depleted carbon sources um, and there's presumably a lot of mixing going on even in the uh, main channel so yeah essentially, and there's, and there's also different um, primary producers in those um, shallower, warmer channels. You've got different, you've essentially got different resources growing there from the main braid. Yep. Yeah, so uh, so for the invertebrate populations, there, there are a lot of different mechanisms that can be going on. Um, some invertebrates, some mayflies can burrow into the gravel and just come back up. Um, in a situation like the cast, 
that actually was discoloured for most of the summer due to snow melt. So they wouldn't be recovering in those areas until much later. But um, it's mainly due to dispersal and um, sort of individual species traits for those invertebrate um, communities. Yeah. 